Hello and welcome back to the Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be continuing our way through the wild ride that is Season 8, and delving into what to this day I think is by miles the worst decision the TV show has ever made. So, without further ado, let us dive in. When we left off, in both versions, the joint communities had dealt their first major blow on the Sanctuary, and Negan's people were pinned down by the Horde. And that is exactly where we'll pick up. In the book, despite the Savior's attempts to clear out the walkers, it is an absolute slog, and it's then that we get one of the most iconic scenes in the book. We see Negan walk back in and simply yell, Mother <coughs> suck. <coughs> Is it ridiculously over the top? Of course it is, but I'd be lying if I said this wasn't one of my favorite moments in All Out War. Negan's always been a character whose language actually colors our perception of him, such as the Spencer case where he explicitly said that he wouldn't swear among many others. So here, where his language is basically exclusively swear words, you can tell that old Negan is getting very, very fed up. I have heard people say that Negan's swearing takes them out of the experience, but I cannot say that I agree. Personally, I just became used to it extremely quickly, and it just became a core characteristic of Negan that, as I just mentioned, simultaneously gives us an insight into his state of mind at any given moment. Though importantly, in the comics, this would be the last we see of them for the time being. As far as we know, they are still clearing out the Horde, and that is all. In the show, on the other hand, we of course get a lot more insight into what's going on in the Sanctuary through the eyes of quite a few characters such as Dwight, Eugene, and Negan himself. And in the midst of all this, we still have Rick, who is dealing with the trash folk. The whole Rick in underwear fighting off some random walkers and whatnot is obviously entirely exclusive to the show and, big surprise, is some of my least favorite stuff in the season. I've said it more than enough times already, so I won't bring it up again, but all it does is just conveniently remove him from the plot for a bit, and that is it. And that is definitely not helped by the fact that the entire trash people back and forth had already been played out to death in my opinion. Though admittedly, what follows next with Rick in the show is absolutely awesome, as we see him recruit the trash folk and they take the fight to the sanctuary yet again. And while I did not care for how we got there, the scene of Rick just seeing all the walkers piled up creating a path outside of the sanctuary is absolutely incredible. As I mentioned a second ago, in the book we never got anything like this, and the surprise factor would come from Negan at Alexandria, which we'll get to in a second. So yeah, definitely not worth an entire episode or so of back and forth, but Rick's moment of realization is a 10 out of 10 scene, and everything from the downright horror-like sound design to Andrew Lincoln's acting is just incredible. Though before we follow up with Rick, we do technically have to jump back in time for a bit, because in the show, there are quite a few more things going on in tandem. And the one I want to talk about specifically is what Rosita's gang is up to. In case you've forgotten, in the show, a lot of the main survivors decide that splitting up and going on rogue missions is the best course of action at the moment. And that is exactly what we're seeing here. And the only way I can describe this entire sequence is just Resident Evil 4 and how goofy a lot of it is. Most of all, the infamous RPG sequence. You're not gonna use that thing. I am sorry, but if you watch this and don't seriously just pause for a second to laugh, then I don't even know. Little did we know, the whole alien story Kirkman alluded to way back must have turned out to be true, because instead of firing rockets, this thing is just a warp cannon that just so happens to spit out some fire in the process. So with that, I guess I'll just say, rest in pieces. He'll be missed. And he was definitely all broken up about it. Okay, I stole all of those from Reddit, so I couldn't come up with anything as funny as that. Brilliant puns aside though, just like with Rick and Daryl, it's pretty clear to me that there was a pretty severe lack of action direction here, because this is really Hollywood action flick levels of stupidity. And this is also yet another reason why I feel like much of the fighting we see is just utterly weightless, because frankly, it just makes absolutely no sense. Anyway, returning to the book for a second, we get a follow-up with Ezekiel, who is very much distraught after his entire squad was wiped out. Here, we see Michonne basically just try to knock some sense back into him, basically just saying that brooding won't get them anywhere and that the community needs a leader. 
much of this is replicated and also a little remix for Carol in the show, but broadly speaking, the overall sentiment is the same. Ezekiel is crushed and people are just trying to get him back up. Another thing that I haven't brought up yet is that in the book, the early half of the war is essentially just a group rotating in and out of Alexandria to carry out the various attacks on the saviors. In the show, on the other hand, like I already mentioned last time, everyone's scattered all over the place because, you know, infinite ammo and supplies. Jokes aside, we see Rick return to Alexandria to update everyone on the happenings, and we see them talk about how they're running low on ammo and that they desperately need Eugene. And just as Rick begins to say that a retaliation is likely on its way and that they need to prepare lookouts, explosions ring out and the church's windows are shattered. They all immediately run outside to get a grasp of the situation and we see that one of the houses is already blown up. And as they make it to the gates, we see none other than our boy Negan with a grenade in hand and screaming out that, lucky for them, he just wants to talk to Rick. And before we follow up with that, let us catch up on everything going on in the show. Obviously a big part of the season are all the callbacks which I've already briefly mentioned last time, but at the same time, a lot of the season is told in a non-linear fashion, especially with everything surrounding Carl. We get the flash forwards, we get the teary eyes Rick, we already got Rick at the graves back in the premiere, and so on. And to be honest with you, from a direction standpoint, I loved every second of it. I'm an absolute sucker for non-linear storytelling, so it's a huge W on that basis alone. But I also think that with the cast expanding over the past few seasons, and the fact that we basically skipped all of the post No Way Out story, we just needed to see the Rick and Carl duo again. So yeah, these scenes were absolutely awesome in my opinion. In story, however, I hate every bit of what it means because it is obviously setting up Carl's death. And speaking of which, let us return to Negan at the gates. In the book, Rick of course realizes that with Negan already being at the gates and with them lacking preparations, there's not much he can really do but concede and talk to Negan here. And on top of that, Negan reveals that he has returned Holly, who is tied up and with a bag over her head. Here, we basically see a remix of the whole Sasha Trojan horse deal. As in the book, Negan lets Holly go back into Alexandria and as soon as the gates are open and they free her, they obviously see that she is turned and Negan commands for the attack to begin in full swing. So instead of Sasha sacrificing herself for the group in an attempt to kill Negan, Holly is the one actually used as a Trojan horse by Negan. She manages to bite Denise but is promptly shot. Though obviously, this creates a lot of chaos within Alexandria, and we see Heath immediately go to make sure that Denise is fine, only for another grenade to go off behind him and blow his leg off. And following this point, all hell breaks loose and Negan just keeps tossing the grenades over the wall as the saviors slowly surround Alexandria to pick off anybody who manages to survive the bombing. Though similar to what we see in the show in just a second, we see Dwight moving within the saviors. He wipes out an entire squad of them by shooting them in the back, and then telling Jesus that he'll give up their entire stack of grenades, finishing by saying to make sure that Rick knows that he's on their side. This might just be a me thing, but I always felt that in the book, it was a little harder to tell on which side Dwight actually is. And I still remember wondering whether he is actually still playing both sides here. I think in the show, his allegiances were always a little clearer, mainly because I think we just got to see a lot more screen time with him and had a better idea of what he's up to. But again, obviously I am biased because I knew a lot of his story from the book already, so feel free to chime in here. In the show, on the other hand, the beginning to the conflict is somewhat similar, as there too he knocks on Alexandria's gates and demands to speak with Rick. Obviously, Rick is not there though, so it's Carl that goes to speak with him instead. And yes, this is a nighttime shoot, so despite my burning hatred for everything that would transpire next, from a cinematic point of view, I do love this confrontation. And before we follow up with Alexandria, we have to jump to all the other battles that are going on in tandem. As is trend for the All Out War part of the story, for better or worse, there's just a lot more going on at the same time in the show, so let's quickly run through all of that. So with that said, it's not just Alexandria that's attacked. It's also Jesus' little group, as well as the entirety of the kingdom, which more on that in a second. As far as Jesus and Maggie goes, big surprise, this is a nighttime shoot and is a ominous confrontation on the road, so I do very much enjoy that. 
That said though, it doesn't really do much for the story, so there's not really much else to delve into. As for the kingdom, it too experiences an attack from the saviors essentially at the same time as Alexandria. As I've said before, I do think that Gavin was a really interesting archetype for the saviors in the show, so I did enjoy some of that conflict fleshed out here, especially with Morgan now entering his full-on clear mode. None of what happens here is really relevant to the bigger story, so the only major thing I want to note here is that exploring the whole remorse angle for Gavin was a nice breath of fresh air for the Negan saga. Though yes, none of this happens in the book, and most of the characters that even play into the kingdom part of the story don't exist at all in the source material. And another problem I'd raise that is relevant both here as well as for Alexandria is that AMC and their infinite wisdom once again decided to split the conflict into two episodes. While the whole Carl deal is a neat stopping point, I do think that the rest of the action felt extremely disjointed as a result, and we basically end up with No Way Out 2.0, where the big hook happens in episode 8, but to actually see it through, you wait 3 months to watch episode 9. Remember 18916? Yeah, this season is a particular offender of that. Returning to Alexandria, obviously the major difference between the two versions is that in the book, Rick is there, while in the adaptation, he's still on his way back from the sanctuary. So as much as Negan wants to talk to him, he isn't even there. Because of that, it is Carl that greets him, and the conversation they have is actually really, really cool in my opinion. And no, not just because it's a nighttime shoot. The thing I really liked here is that Negan does rightfully call out some of what Rick and the Alexandrians have been up to as well. Most of all, telling them that there are kids in the sanctuary, something that Carl was well aware of. And specifically naming baby Gracie, who'd now obviously grow up without her real parents. Again, I don't want to delve into the whole rabbit hole that is the morality debate between the two sides, but with such a conflict, these sorts of tragedies are inevitable and I really like that it was addressed. Yes, Rick and the joint communities may be fighting for their freedom, but they are certainly not saints either. And I think with Baby Gracie specifically, giving us this very personal example of that was a brilliant addition for the show. And similarly, Carl's role here was awesome in my opinion and was a brief showcase of how they could have leveraged the darker side of his character. Obviously in this specific sequence, the whole kill me aspect is because he knows he's bitten. But if you look past that and think about how he assembled the whole plan for the community to hide while keeping Negan at bay, I think it just makes me wonder what else the TV Carl could have been spun into. Obviously, not much point in thinking about that now, but fret not, we'll be talking plenty more about Carl in just a second. As far as the rest of the conversation goes, there is no Holly-like sequence here, and after Negan realizes that Carl is largely just stalling, in the show, he too just commands his people to attack. I'll be honest, I'm not even sure if I'm nitpicking here or not, I feel like it is once again turned up to Hollywood levels, because instead of just having basic grenades, literally each and every one of them have grenade launchers. And the reason why I say I may be nitpicking is that technically we have seen military outposts that were trying to contain the virus originally, but still, I feel like grenade launchers isn't exactly something you find in bulk. A box of grenades seems believable, but not a box of grenade launchers. But yeah, to be fair, I have no idea and maybe they would be carrying out like 50 grenade launchers and Negan just so happened to find them, I don't know. Though one thing I do know is that I can explain the ridiculousness of Season 8. Because we finally have an answer to how Negan has so many saviors. And yes, I was right all along because we are indeed in an arcade shooter, they simply respawn. You think I'm lying now, don't you? Well then, look at this dude who was captured and taken to the hilltop as a prisoner. Well f*** you Rick, because he respawned back at the sanctuary and here he is again. Gotta be careful when you get 3 million extras. Jokes aside, the rest of the attack is relatively similar. A whole bunch of the explosives go off, Carl is knocked to the ground in both versions, only in the show he is of course alone, while in the book he is 1, literally 10 years old, and 2, Rick and Andrea are there with him. But broadly speaking, it's just everything going boom boom. Though a change in the show is that Negan does actually go through the gates, whereas in the comic, he technically never does. Similar to the book, Dwight also fires on his own people, only to be caught by Laura. But of course, he has Daryl and the others as backup there, so he is mostly fine. 
In the book, on the other hand, Dwight's whole backstabby attack is only a small part of the bigger picture. Because what ultimately stops Negan from going through Alexandria's gates is Maggie and the Hilltop, who essentially sandwiched the saviors between Alexandria and their forces, just forcing them to escape. But as far as Negan goes, he still considers the whole thing as an absolute win because as far as he's concerned, the rest of Alexandria will simply burn to the ground, even saying that the smoke means that they've just won. And to be fair, he is mostly right. Rick blacked out because of a concussion he got from one of the explosives. And even after several hours pass and he wakes up, most of Alexandria is still absolutely engulfed by flames. And so, they simply decide to leave. Oh, and also, Carl calls Rick a wimp for getting a concussion, which becomes a bit of a running joke in the comic. Though with that, everyone is basically preparing to leave, where we also get a scene of Rick briefly looking at the phone, which is of course in reference to Lori. I've talked about this before, but it's just another case of the book more explicitly bringing up past events and not just subtle callbacks, but as explicit things in the story. I've mentioned the whole naming dead characters things before, but I think this also very much fits that bill. And finally, we get the splash panel of everyone getting in cars, as Rick turns around to look at Alexandria for what originally many thought to be the last time. I don't know what it is about this panel specifically, but it is genuinely one of my favorites in All Out War. It's sort of like that shot of Rick and Carl leaving the destroyed prison behind. The whole leaving your destroyed home vibe always just hits super hard, and I think that was executed absolutely wonderfully here. Still talking about the book, on Negan's side, immediately following the attack, they go to pick up another certain individual who is obviously a major piece of this whole war. Dr. Smarty Pants, Eugene. He just goes right into Eugene's production sites and just captures everyone there. As I've mentioned more than a few times before, the question of ammunition always felt so, so much more important in the book, and this is just another case of that. Especially with the strategic implications of Negan cutting off what is essentially the Joint Alliance's strongest supply line. This was an absolutely massive blow. In the show, on the other hand, everyone's got infinite ammo, so that would only be relevant for the last 30 seconds of the season. Finally returning to the show, unlike the bulk, Negan does very much go through the gates and right into Alexandria. And while overall, I do very much prefer the comic version for quite a few reasons, I do think that the production team really nailed the tension of this entire sequence. Again, I feel like the nighttime setting helps a lot, but I seriously got almost Governor vibes with a track that is eerily similar to the pulse kicking in and all that. Well, that's when I'm gonna kill you in front of everybody. So yes, Bear McCreary is once again carrying the scene big time. And it's made even more intense as we actually see Negan and Rick throw down, which very much had that Governor versus Michonne vibes. And of course, the whole Negan talk in this one is excellent, especially the whole, you ever shut up? Nope. That said, I do think that the end of the fight is honestly a tad goofy, and Rick just running off after getting thrown out of the window feels a bit off. It's not that it doesn't make sense. I think he should have tried running as soon as he reasonably could have. But just the way the scene plays out feels a little bit comedic to me. That may totally just be a me thing because my brain has been ruined by memes, so feel free to chime in. But with that said, obviously every single thing we've talked about today is nothing compared to the last three minutes of the episode as they reveal that Carl is bitten. Now, before we get into the whole debate surrounding this, I'll be the first to admit that the almost 28 days later sounding music, as we are very slowly given hints of Carl's fate, is nothing short of excellence. And the small candle lights with us panning away as they are quite literally enthralled by darkness is also just pure perfection. Not to mention that from an emotional point of view, I don't think I'm the first one to say that I was in complete and utter disbelief that they'd actually pull something like this. I do distinctly remember that there were wild spoilers flying around saying that Carl dies, but they were so incredibly outlandish that I think everybody just wrote them off without giving them a second thought, including me, I never believed it for a second. And also, even taking a step back from this moment, the fact that hints towards Carl's death were actually dropped throughout the entirety of the season is some excellent direction. And rightfully, his death, especially in retrospect, was given a ton of room to breathe. 
So yes, from a direction, cinematography, acting and sound design standpoint, this reveal was about as good as you can get. That said, now it is time to get into the story, most of which is unfortunately the bad. First and foremost, I've said it many many times already, but in case you need a reminder, the story of The Walking Dead is literally a retelling from Carl in the book, so clearly, him dying here undermines all of that. After the reveal happened and people immediately just asked, but why? Gimple explained that Carl's death was written in order to make the whole Rick forgiving Negan deal feel a lot more natural. Which, frankly, has never really made sense to me, considering they adapted the final confrontation relatively faithfully only in the book. Carl was perfectly fine and Rick still used Negan as a principal. And on top of that, their massive gamble clearly hasn't even paid off, as there are still countless people who still say that Negan should have been killed off in the season 8 finale. In my mind, even a character like Baby Gracie could have been leveraged to bonk Rick over the head that what they're doing has far-reaching consequences, and that because of all of this violence, children are losing their parents. In my mind, you could easily pull that together and the underlying theme of The Walking Dead, that has always been Rick protecting his son and still have the same ending. Rick understands that keeping Negan as an example is a far better way of moving forward, because he sees that violence only breeds violence. Then of course you have the ever-present question of The Walking Dead. Should characters die to walker bites? The easy answer is obviously yes. This is a zombie show and the walkers should be a consistent threat, especially with more than half of the cast just running around on their own. But on the flip side, are you seriously going to kill off a season 1 character who, in Carl's case, is the literal backbone of The Walking Dead with a walker bite that happened off screen no less? And this is where I'd refer back to season 5 after the group reached Alexandria. If you recall, there too we talked about the wasted potential of someone like Noah for example. But the thing with the Noah example is that as much as his story was cut short, it was not years and years of compounding story. In that case, you can at least say that its entire purpose was to re-establish the walkers as an always present threat. With Carl on the other hand, I feel like that was just utterly wasted. The easy comparison here is of course Andrew and the book, but there too the circumstances, in my opinion at least, are drastically different. And I feel like her death did serve a much much bigger purpose. We'll of course get to it plenty more when we're actually there, but yeah, as far as I'm concerned, a walker death for Carl did a massive disservice to the character. And of course, on top of all of that, there are plenty of externalities. First off, I want to dispel all the copium-filled things people say when talking about Carl's death. One of which saying that Carl's actor wanted to leave the show. This is just plain false, and literally every single report points in the complete opposite direction. With even Scott Gimple saying that, yes, this was 100% a story decision. On top of that, Chandler Riggs literally bought a house in Georgia to have an easier time with shoots. I am no finance professional, but if I was essentially fired, I don't think buying a house closer to my workplace from which I was fired is a wise idea. In a similar vein, Chandler wanted to leave for college. This too is just plain false and there really isn't anything more else to say there. And if you still had doubts, just look at what Chandler's parents said about it. And you know that parents will be brutally honest if they are mad. And I quote, Watching Gimple fire my son two weeks before his 18th birthday after telling him they wanted him for the next three years was disappointing. I never trusted Gimple or AMC, but Chandler did. I know how much it hurt him. But we do absolutely know how lucky we have been to be a part of it all and appreciate the love from all the fans. So yes, that might just be the most passive-aggressive thing I've ever read. But I think this more than confirms that whatever it was that transpired behind the scenes was not exactly pretty. So put very briefly, Carl was killed off for story reasons which many, including me, believe to be nonsensical and there really is nothing much more to it. But please, I know people blame Gimple specifically and even I clown on him from time to time, but that is just not fair in my opinion. There is an entire team of people behind the show. It is simply too big to be run by a single person. There are many, many people who likely could have pushed against the decision to kill off Carl, so once again, please just chill out with the Gimple hate. 
If I can do anything with this little Walking Dead community we have here is just try to lessen the sometimes very overwhelming negativity. So yeah, please don't tweet angry things at the production team or basically anyone else involved with the show. Having problems with the story and criticizing it is perfectly fine, but please don't make it personal. Alright, I'll get off my soapbox now. And with that said, I know many people weren't fans of Carl and were likely, if not happy, then they just didn't really care that he died. Well, it's time for me to ruin your parade too, because this goes far, far deeper. And before we get into it, I want you to think about that friend you spent a summer with and had to say goodbye later. Or better yet, imagine your high school graduation and saying goodbye to many of your friends. Or that time you moved away and had to say goodbye to everyone you knew back home. And once you've got that picture in your mind, think of Andrew Lincoln. Imagine playing the role of a father and literally seeing this boy grow up in front of your eyes with the promise that he'd be the one to carry on the mantle in the future. Think of what that does emotionally, only for him to be suddenly written out. Sure, for many it may seem overblown, no one is dying in the real world, right? They just wouldn't work together, it's really no big deal. But again, think back to you saying goodbye. Stretch that to like 10 years of working together and add Andrew Lincoln more than likely also being a very real-world father figure to Chandler. You've seen the behind-the-scenes photos I sometimes throw up here. It's pretty clear that everyone there was long past the professional relationship and were actually friends. So it shouldn't surprise you that Chandler's departure also fueled Andrew Lincoln's exit in the very next season, which was already prolonged with a hefty paycheck to make sure he sticks around. For some additional context, The Walking Dead films in Georgia and the US, while Andrew's family is back in the UK. So, not surprisingly, being away from them for months at a time, as he himself would say, the decision came in large part just because of him wanting to spend more time with them instead of baking in the Georgia heat every year. A couple of years ago, Chandler on Reddit broke the silence on this exact thing. Saying that Andrew had been talking about exiting the show in Season 8 himself, it was only after hearing of Carl's death that he supposedly actually sounded serious. I'll have his full response linked below, but the gist of it is that Chandler at least believes that it was Carl's death that was a major push for Andrew leaving as well. And I, for one, find that very much plausible. Again, clearly there was a very strong friendship between Andrew and Chandler. So if there was even the faintest thought at the back of his mind about leaving, this more than likely pushed him over the edge. That said though, as with many decisions that come with a lot of emotion behind it, they can often backfire. As recently as July of 2021, Lincoln has said that both he and his family now want him to return to the series. Which might actually be another reason as to why the supposed movie suddenly turned into a miniseries. It might just be as simple as Andrew being more open to working on The Walking Dead again. And so, to sum it all up, do I think Andrew left because of Carl's death? No, correlation is not causation and all that. He left because he wanted to spend time with his family and depending on who you ask and where you look, some actually claim that Andrew had brought this up as soon as even season 4. But was it a major contributor to him wanting to leave as one of his strongest links to the show was now severed? In my opinion, yes, 100%. I think there's a very good reason why people get accountability partners for working out and things like that. Having someone you develop a relationship with is a major boost to get through the hard days. And I think in many ways, Chandler was exactly that for Lincoln. I obviously don't claim to be breaking down any psychology here, but to me at least, this is more than a believable scenario. Which brings us on to the why. Why kill off what is the most important character in the show and the literal future of the story? Well, the common theories are one, it was an attempt to reignite hype through headlines a la, oh my god, The Walking Dead just killed off the biggest character. And two, they did not want to pay Chandler a much higher wage since his contract was to be renewed as he turns 18. And while I do think trying to read the tea leaves here is a bit of a futile task and frankly a pointless one, I would not be surprised if these two factors did indeed play into it. Andrew Lincoln did later get a absolutely ridiculous paycheck to stick around for the four episodes in season 9, which to me always seemed like AMC desperately trying to just not burn the whole thing down after they messed up. But as far as money goes, more often than not, we have seen them be quite stingy. 
I've said this many times already, but please, if somebody on the cast ever sees this, can I please pick your brain about this stuff? Please, please, please give me an interview. But on the flip side, I do also find that a little weird, considering they were always adamant about adding a whole bunch of extras, which would likely add up to Chandler's increased pay anyway, so who knows. So whether it was indeed money or just the hubris of the writers, fact of the matter is, I think this was by miles the biggest blunder in the TV series, and in my mind, started a bit of a death spiral for the show. But out of fear of rambling on for literally three more hours, that's where I'll leave it for now. But again, just to restate, as much as I hate what absolutely each and every aspect of this does to the story, the sequence itself is shot and executed beautifully, so at least it has that. And speaking of which, with that, those flash forwards also become much more clear. As with the death of Carl, not surprisingly, Rick is indeed shaken to his very core. It does result in some really good moments in the latter half of the season, which we'll get to plenty more next time, but even the positives in this case, I do think were a little dampened by yet another baffling AMC decision, which, as I mentioned a second ago, was to split this entire deal into the mid-season finale and the mid-season premiere. Obviously, with something as big as Carl's death, people immediately got to questioning whether or not this whole thing was even legit, which then prompted for Gimple to say basically, yep, yeah, it is indeed legit. So, for the final time, a solid 90% of this is beautiful filmmaking with a very subpar narrative in my opinion. And on that somewhat unfortunately depressing note, this is where we'll pick up next time. With Carl no longer being there, of course both Negan and Rick will act quite a bit differently from the book, but even aside from that, the remainder of the war also plays out very very differently between the two versions. Especially with the show choosing to extend a whole bunch of the scenes and cut others outright. So next time we'll be delving into all the debates of whether or not Negan should have even lived through the war and all of that. And of course all the other changes the adaptation made in the final act of the All Out War arc. And that's the video. Once again a bit of a meta talk heavy one, but one I definitely wanted to spend more time on considering the ramifications of Carl's death. Though with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Monkey D. Moritz. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye